Greetings student, it's HP Lamini Public Law N6 again. Please make your prescribed book for N6 handy because we'll be referring to it now and again. Today we're doing the historical review and the development of South African law. All what we must know because uh, we are dealing with history. In our introduction, you must just know that uh, For any law, it's imperative that you acquire knowledge of that, or of the history of that particular law, right? Because it is the very same law which assists you with the present character of the law you're dealing with, right? South African law is often referred to as Roman Dutch law, which is a combination of two legal systems. Which legal systems are those? It's the Roman as well as the Dutch. So the historical component of South African law is called common law. So a major part of common law is unwritten, right? And it was taken over from other legal systems. The development of uh, South African law Please just open your books on page 8 and look at that triangular uh, diagram for, which illustrates as to where we're coming from with our law. You'll see on top it's written Roman law, right? Let's call it uh, the first layer of our cake, the wedding cake, you know. The first layer, it's Roman law. That was originated in the Western Europe, that is Italy, in from, two, from 753 BC to AD 565. So the spoken language there was Latin. Now it's Italian, they just say Italian. It was Latin and Greek based on the civilization of the time. So Roman law then moved to the Netherlands. Netherlands also practiced Roman law. So it became Roman Dutch law. Why? Because in, ne in the Netherlands, they were speaking Dutch. That is why it's called Roman Dutch law. Then now you'll remember when Jan, when Jan van Rupik uh, left the Netherlands to the Cape in South Africa. That was in 1652. So when he came here, he came with this Roman Dutch law. So these are two layers of the cake, all right? So when he was in, in the Cape, he ruled the Cape from 1652 up until 1794, 94, 95, somewhere there. Then in 1795, Britain, Britain took over the Cape Colony. So when they took over the Cape, the Cape Colony, they came with their British laws. So now they added their British law into this uh, Roman Dutch law. In South Africa, we had our own laws, though we were primitive during those days. It was called the indigenous law, which still subsists even today. Right? In 1836, you'll remember from your book, uh, the Municipal Administration Book, N5, where we talk about the four trekkers who were sick and tired of the uh, British rule in the Cape, and they left uh, for Orange Free State and Transvaal. And they were later called the Boer Republics. They became the two Boer Republics. So when they left the Cape, they left with the indigenous, I mean, the indigenous law plus Roman Dutch law, right, to the Cape. So that's the formation of our South African law now, right? So these Boer Republics, when they settled in the Cape, uh, in, the, in the Orange Free State, sorry, Orange Free State, the Transvaal, as well as some of them who came to Natal, they were practicing the Roman Dutch law. I'm sure we're still together on that one. 
So now we're talking about the development. We'll start our development with the Roman law. Roman law itself. Translated from Rome, you remember Rome is the capital of Italy. And the first codification of the Roman law was in 450 BC, that is 450 before Christ, right? So it was uh, kept in the law of the 12 tables. It developed for 12 centuries. And uh, during those days, you remember that uh, it was the time of the emperors, the kings and queens who were in power in all other countries. So in 510 BC, uh, they had in Rome, they had a, a, a king who was driven out of Italy and they started a new constitutional order, right? So when they established this new constitutional order, they moved away from the emperors and the kings and they started with the magistrates. The magistrates were also referred to as praetors, right? So the magistrates the practice of magistrates also gave rise to the jurists. The jurists were the, were the people who were doing the science of law. They specialized on law. And uh, there was this other guy, this person, Justinian, who was an emperor of the Eastern Roman Empire. Justinian, what he did was that he wrote a Corpus Iuri. There's a book called Corpus, it's Italian. It's Corpus Iuri Civilis. So in English, you can just say, you can just write Corpus Iuris Civilis because you are using English, right? The Corpus Iuri Civilis then was then a uh, followed in the Western Europe, right? And it was mostly practiced because it was rejected by Britain. It, 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 was, it was mostly practiced in, uh, in Italy. There's a university called the University of Bologna, which was the first university of law in Italy. And that university is, is still, it's still there today. It's now plus, it's more than 900 years old. If you go there after the, the COVID-19, then you can visit that place as a, a place of, uh, a place uh, of, of which you can enjoy as a place where you can see some of the things we talk about here because they are, it's like a museum now, right? It's a heritage site. We move to the Dutch, to the Roman Dutch law now, right? Roman Dutch law, there were the codifications. And during that period, all the countries in the West, they decided to codify their, their laws. What is meant by codification? It's just, uh, it's just to, 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 to write down the laws and to make a source where even the, the other, the later generations would go and look for answers in that law. So Roman Dutch law remained a common denominator as they were doing that practice. So there were also the old jurists, who, who, people who, whom we refer to as the old jurists, that was uh, those who are very, very important when we talk about law. You will find them on page 11, uh, on the gray part, some of them, the, their names are Hugo de Groot, Johannes Foot, Yo Simon van Leuven, Johannes van der Linden. So their work is written on their books. You'll see in your book on page 11, right? Then we move to the British law. In 1806, 1806 uh, the Roman Dutch law was then accepted by the British because they were not happy about the Roman Dutch law, right? Then, 
After those people, the the fortrackers had left the Cape and were practicing this this Roman law. In eight, in 1902, there was uh, an anglo boer war which took place. It was between Britain and the two Boer republics, that is, Free State and the Transvaal. And that, uh, that war ended up in 1902 with the Treaty of Ferenichen, right? And during the Treaty of Ferenichen, the Boers surrendered and the British, and the British formed the Union of South Africa, okay? South African law is uncodified, like all other laws in other countries. So the reason why it's not codified is because there are so many reasons. There are so many reasons you can see some of them. You can also uh, count apart it, right? So the functions now of uh, the constitution, constitutional law. We're moving to South African, or oh, before the constitutional law, there's South African law resources on page 13. You'll see them, they are written in a clear point form that you must study because they, they usually ask them in your exams. Sources of South African law, you do that, then the functions of, uh, const of the constitutional law, they are also on page 13 also in a clear point form. Sources of South African constitutional law now, it's the legislation, the statutes, the custom, right? So when or why does the legislature decides to pass legislation? So one, when there are gaps in the law, that when there are defects in the law, and when the needs of the community are no longer satisfied by the current law. Okay? Then let's go to the common law. The rules valid for the entire community. That is our common law. And we also find the precedent, the judicial precedent. The judicial precedent, you as you'll see, they're also written in a point form on page 15. You'll just read through. It's easy. Okay? Then we come to the customary law. Customary law, it's also unwritten law. And uh, if you want to prove the existence of the customary law, or if you want to use the customary law, you must first prove it. In a case of Van Breda versus Jacobs, the court decided as follows, right? I won't tell you the facts of the case. You'll find the facts of the case in the book on page 15. But the findings there were that uh, the custom must have, must have been long established. One. Two, it must be reasonable. Three, it must be, it must have been constantly observed, and the last one, it must be definite, right? Then the indigenous law was applied by the black communities as it is even now. And the authors and modern textbook, it's also some of the developments, the authors will refer to the old authors like uh, Hugo de Hort, Van der Linden, and all those uh, uh, authors we, we just, uh, I've just said, I've just read. Uh, foreign law, which is the last one. Foreign law covers a variety of subjects like diplomatic relations, air traffic, use of open seas. I think you must know what is meant, because they usually ask, what is meant by these? So when we talk about the foreign laws, usually the foreign law will take the part of the international law uh, international law, that is, we'll talk about the United Nations and the conventions, and that the states which were which are which are violating the international laws are taken to the International Court of Justice, which is called the ICC in The Hague, that is in Netherlands, right? 
So the foreign law itself will cover things like the law which covers the diplomatic relations, that is the exchange of ambassadors, for example. Air traffic, we will talk about aviation. The use of open seas, uh, you'll use the, your, of the United Law of the Seas, the conventions and the maritime laws. International principles with regard to human rights, they're also there. Laws relating to warfare, they're also there under foreign law. Foreign law and international law are also recognized by our South African constitution. For example, in a case of capital punishment in a state versus Mokonyana, the foreign law as well as the international law was uh, observed, was considered, were, con were considered. Thank you so much. I think you must go back and read. This is the history. So that is why it's a bit longer. But you must go back and read your book. This, I think this will make sense when you read it. Thank you. I will follow, I will make a follow up with uh, module three in due course. Stay safe.